for seven o'clock and I'd like to call the joint meeting with the Lexington Planning Commission, Lexington City Council to order and invite my uh, colleague, Mr. Driscoll to call his group together. Good evening. I'd like to call to order the Lexington Planning Commission meeting, the joint planning commission and city council meeting. Terrific. Uh, we are uh, in session and uh, I'd like to call on Arnie to uh, kick us off and uh, uh, begin. And before you begin, Arnie, did I see in the screen that you have uh, a new accoutrement on your right hand? I thought I saw somebody with a brace on the right hand. Oh, that was Blake. Oh, Blake. That was okay. Blake. Ah. Uh, yeah. uh, it, it's, <laughs> I just got a mountain bike, and it was just <laughs> doubled in price, maybe tripled in price for this, the, the cost of <laughs> my broken wrist. What was that? Did it happen in the city or the county? <laughs> it was uh, WNL campus, so I think that, that, that's the city. But not glad you survived property. the crash. <laughs> it's a work-related injury. Not a work-related injury. It's mount mountain biking on back there. Beautiful <clears throat> trails <throat> back there. Beautiful Another trails. Another COVID-related yeah. incident. <laughs> Arnie, take it away. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. As you know, the Planning Commission has been working for a couple of years on the new comprehensive plan. I'm going to provide just a quick overview. Dr. Bradley is going to give you sort of a what's new in this plan, and Camille will then um, follow up with a sort of perspective on the shift that's occurred in this plan. And after reviewing what we're going to go over this evening, I also thought that you may want to hear from Leslie, um, your liaison to the Planning Commission, and then it'll be open up for questions. If there are no questions at the moment, I'm going to go ahead and start just quickly giving you an overview. Um, what is the purpose of a comprehensive plan? A comprehensive plan is a long-range planning document that localities use to guide the many decisions they make over time. It describes the community's vision for where it wants to be in 20 years with specific strategies to get there. Much of what goes in the comprehensive plan is dictated by the state, but it's also the heart of a community-driven process, and each plan is unique for each community. The planning process was, we used a four-step process, with the first part being gathering and analyzing data, the second part being a community input and visioning, the third part being development of planning elements or chapters, and then a review, refinement, and adoption phase that we're in now. The plan structure, if you look at the table of contents, you'll see that there's a welcome section, there's a section about a section about the plan, um, a plan framework with your vision, values, objectives, and goals. And then our elements, which we used to call chapters, but are now called elements. You have historic resources, green infrastructure, and natural resources, local economy, arts and culture, housing, land use, transportation, community facilities, and infrastructure, and governance. That section is then followed up by an implementation section and then appendices. Okay. And that's just a quick overview. And if there aren't any questions for me, Dr. Bradley is going to give you a review of kind of what's new in this comprehensive plan. Did you go? Yep, Dr. Bradley, okay. take it away. Yep. Okay. All right. So uh, as Arnie said, I'm going to try to give a bit of a, a, a tour through what's, uh, what, what we think is new and different and what our, what our approach was to this. Uh, perhaps the biggest uh, change you'll see in this plan is a reorganization on both a textual and a conceptual level. As a text, uh, as a document, you'll see a very different look, made possible in part, of course, by the advances in digital production. There's more color, clearer graphics, greater variety of layout and formatting. It's all digital, of course, and easier to navigate as a whole. So hopefully much easier to read and use overall. Part of this is also that it's a much slimmer volume. That is due in part, as we'll see, to the changes on a conceptual level. There was a deliberate attempt to draft a more cohesive vision that would be articulated in a more tightly structured document. Arnie mentioned the nine planning elements, and these correspond to the nine chapters in the earlier plan with a few changes I'll mention in a moment. The difference is that we work to develop a structure for the plan as a whole that would reflect our understanding of what we want for Lexington and how we conceive of the work of a comp plan. And that would also in turn structure each chapter. The plan as a whole has a guiding vision statement. Quote, the city of Lexington will develop strategically and sustainably by diversifying economic opportunities, housing options and transportation methods, 
while protecting the city's rich historic and natural resources and preserving the quality of life enjoyed by its residents and visitors, end quote. The vision recognizes that the physical, economic, and social aspects of our city are all interconnected, all intertwined. This vision is then supported and guided by five values, accessibility and diversity, sustainable economy, local identity and character, citizen engagement, management and collaboration. Each in each chapter, there's a single overarching goal that we conceived of in relation to the five core values of the plan, each of which to be reflected in the objectives we hope to achieve through the specific strategies that we fashion. The analysis of where we are as a city in each planning element, our strengths and our needs, helped guide us in developing objectives and strategies that will align with the stated goals and values. This pattern is repeated in each chapter. The idea is that we want always to keep our community's values and vision of itself as the guiding principles throughout. We hope that we've done justice to the extensive community input we received with the result that this plan represents a true community vision. In short, the idea was not to have nine discrete chapters with no explicit guiding principles. We wanted each chapter to show how we recognize that there's an organic interconnectedness among all the planning elements we chose to address. One thing you'll notice is that the main body of the plan has much less dense technical material. Much of this sort of information was moved to the appendices with the thinking being that we wanted to make this document as accessible and user friendly as possible and therefore more relevant and used. Another big difference is in the rethinking of our planning priorities and approaches. I noticed in comparing this new addition to the 2007 comp plan that there's a fair bit of overlap or revisiting of goals and objectives. This is to be expected. Same town, same strengths and challenges to a large extent. Thus, we've addressed some of the same persistent issues. For example, need for affordable housing, updating the city's infrastructure, and the necessity of strengthening the tax base. We also have had to grapple with emerging issues, such as an aging population, sustainable economic development practices, increasing the use of renewable energy, and improved pedestrian and non-vehicular connectivity among our neighborhoods. What we've needed to do is build on the previous plan while broadening the scope and considering new chapters and new approaches to old problems. Arts and culture was added as a new chapter. The fact that Lexington is a culturally vibrant city was not entirely absent from the previous plan. However, we came to feel that because arts and culture play such a central role in our area, it deserved its own chapter. One of the biggest changes in approach, I believe, is in the green infrastructure and natural resources section, formerly simply natural resources. The previous plan stated plainly, quote, green infrastructure planning should be integrated into this chapter when it is updated, end quote. And it gave as a goal, quote, encourage local environmental and community groups to work together with the assistance of city staff to engage the community in the planning process to create a green infrastructure plan, end quote. Well, as we worked on this plan, we quickly realized that this was going to be too large a task to complete and incorporate into this completely rewritten comp plan. However, a green infrastructure plan and an environmental and climate action plan are two objectives that simply can't be luxuries or extras. We've heard loud and clear that there, this, is a central, this is central to our community's needs and vision, and this occasioned the foregrounding of the notion of green infrastructure, signals a more intentional, active understanding of and approach to interacting with our environment. Another area in which we took a new approach is in land use. Since ours is a compact, largely built out city with largely set land use patterns, this chapter focuses on the future land use plan as a tool in guiding any future redevelopment or infill with an emphasis on form, connectivity, and character. An attempt is made again to talk about future land use in the context of the overarching goal and values of the plan and to offer a vision or a picture of the city's future. The future land use plan is structured around five main land use areas, each with planning objectives and designs principles. These land use areas are gateways, centers, corridors, opportunity areas and pattern areas, with the pattern areas basically mirroring the different zoning districts on the city zoning map. One thing that we hope will be innovative is the use of small area planning for the five designated opportunity areas. The idea is to use a process that works from significant public input and coordination with city government to take a holistic look at developing or revitalizing areas that might impact surrounding neighborhoods or vary from the underlying pattern area principles. In other words, we'll need to be creative and flexible, but also sensitive to existing conditions. We also took a slightly different approach to dealing with our history. We have a planning element now entitled Historic Resources. 
where the 2007 plan seemed to focus more on a bricks and mortar historic preservation approach, this plan expands on our understanding of the role that history plays in our town. The goal of the chapter itself in focusing on quality of life, cultural and recreational opportunities and tourism recognizes how deeply intertwined our history is in all aspects of our city's life, the physical, economic, and social aspects I mentioned earlier. Much of the historical narrative has been moved to an appendix. I think we have a clearer picture of just how deeply interconnected our past and present are. There was also an attempt to present a fuller, more nuanced, more honest account of our city's history and to take a more proactive role in promoting inclusion and equity in planning, housing, and the delivery of services. The final planning element, governance, you'll see has received a slight makeover as well. This can be seen first in the title, a change from government, a subtle but I think telling change. It conveys, I hope, a more active tone, whereas the government chapter of the 2007 plan had a fuller civics lesson on the formal structure of our government, this chapter should now show more of the role that good governance practices can play in our city and how we can engage with our community. So the hope is that we've created a plan that presents an explicit vision and set of values in a cohesive, uniformly structured way that will make for a more nimble planning tool. What I noticed lacking in evaluating the previous plan is any record of how that plan was used and what was accomplished or implemented and what was left on the shelf and why. One last innovation I'll mention in this regard is the introduction of the idea of catalyst projects. These catalyst projects are strategies from the plan that will activate it once adopted and connected to other departments in city hall, residents, businesses, and policymakers, primarily city council. The summary of catalyst projects will include an explanation of what category of implementation they are and how the outcome will be measured. The primary criteria we are currently considering for recommending a project or strategy are that it can be initiated or undertaken within the year, will require little or no cost, or are a priority that can be initiated when funds become available, and that it engages existing resources among staff, boards, commissions, and active organizations. How well all of these new approaches to planning and the crafting of a comp plan will work, of course, will be a function of implementation. So with that, I'll turn it over to Camille, who will discuss a new conception for implementing the plan and keeping it as the living working tool. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. I'm actually going to go back a little bit in history and say that um, <clears throat> since the Commonwealth of Virginia adopted a requirement for a comprehensive plan, all localities have generally been in compliance, but it was viewed primarily as a compliance document. You wrote it, council voted on it, and then that was pretty much it. Comprehensive plans generally had two uses. One was developers, when they would bring an application to planning commission, would cite language from the comprehensive plan to justify the development as being in line with the city's vision. The second way was when the city applied for grants, state or federal, they would use the comprehensive plan to say this is part of the intent of where we wanted to go. But I would say out of experience with 18 years on planning commission in Lexington, but other than that, once council adopted the comprehensive plan, it was pretty much sitting on the shelf. I was never at a meeting of planning commission after adoption where we came back around to the comprehensive plan to say, how are we doing? And Pat mentioned that there was no accountability, no checklist. Um, Lex Lexington is not alone in having treated this as solely a compliance document all other localities did, but about 10 or so years ago, there was a, a, a shift in thinking in localities to say, if you're putting this energy into it, why don't you then go ahead and work on the implementation of it? Um, and it was through Kelly with the Berkeley Group, when she introduced the idea of linking the comprehensive plan to the capital improvement plan, that we began seeing and that there was a different way of thinking about this comprehensive plan. John did considerable research on it. We looked at a number of models he and I did um, that he identified. None of the other localities models seemed to be a good fit for Lexington. Um, and I can explain, or John can, why some of that happened. But from that review came a model that we think will work for Lexington and um, John and I presented it to 
the city manager and um, Jim and Arnie made some revisions to the model. And so what we're very excited about is that once council approves the comprehensive plan, that actual implementation and beta testing of the model can begin immediately. Um, so what this does is ensures that we move the plan from the conceptual adopted to actual implementation of a reality that we really want to see. And there are three ways this happens. One is through use of the CIP, but as you know, you're just now starting the staff to look at the budgeting process, and those monies are not going to be available until July 1. The second way is to look at priorities that don't have to have immediate significant funding, but as money is found, it can be directed to those projects, or as Public Works, for example, is implementing its work plan, that with these priorities in mind, they can shape their work to actually accomplish some of the goals. And an example of that might be neighborhood connectivity. So as Public Works is working on sidewalks and street improvements, that they do so with an idea of how to improve neighborhood connectivity and flow. And then the third way is through the catalyst projects. And Pat's explained that we see its importance in that, again, it will allow us to begin probably November, December, on things the city can begin doing from the comp plan that are low or no cost. Um, I think that's all I have to share with you. I hope that gives some overview. I'm personally very excited because I think this commission has done an outstanding job of shifting how the comprehensive plan looks and its usefulness, but it's also been a great mind shift into implementation. John, that took probably a little more time than I said it would, but thank you. Thank you, Camille, and Pat and Arnie. Um, Frank, i turn it to you. And Terrific. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Camille, for the, and, and Pat, um, and Arnie for the intro and setup for all of that. And uh, more importantly, thank you for all the work that you and um, current Planning Commission members and previous commission uh, Planning Commission members have done to bring this document forward to uh, help our community uh, have a good plan. Um, at this point, I'd love to open up to city council members for questions they have or um, uh, curiosities or any other discussion. Um, I, I would just ask, I wanna make sure, I'm looking at the August 26th version of this document. Is that the right one or am I? Okay, so I am looking at the right one. Uh, one, I want to thank the Planning Commission for all of your work on this. This is an incredibly impressive document and I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of it and I'm so, so pleased with what you guys did. Uh, question for like minor little, you know, grammatical or issues or whatnot. Is there, is there somebody that we should like reach out to and I, I mean, who's kind of taking care of those minor things? That would be me. This is Arnie. I'm um, okay. going to explain um, a little bit about the version. The last version that was posted for public comment is the August 26th version that you have, and it's been posted since um, that time. And that was the version that was used for the September 10th Planning Commission public hearing. We did get a number of comments, and I believe you were forwarded or given the resolution. So the Planning Commission made a resolution on the September 10th after their public hearing saying that they recommend approval of the that August 26th version. And then along with that came an attachment with 51 recommended changes. When you're ready for your public hearing, those changes will be made. So it won't just be a plan with recommended changes. Those will all be incorporated into the latest or final draft version for um, advertisement for that public hearing. Camille. Frank, just one brief thing, I forgot to mention this. Um, I would like to suggest that Pat's comments be included in the appendix of the comprehensive plan, because I think it gives great context and would help the next planning commission think about how it wants to approach the document. So thank you. Thanks, Camille. Any objection to making that addition? 
very good. Michelle? I uh, just want to say, um, wow, I love this document. <laughs> um, I, I just can't believe the difference from, well, obviously the old one, but uh, really just impressed by the format, the, the layout, the, just the visuals, and lots and lots of data that I found really interesting that I just, you know, tons of data, obviously, um, it gives us a, a, at least some background and, and, and benchmarks. Um, I, I, I just think it's just great. I kind of honed in on um, the green infrastructure because I know that was a real uh, area that you beefed up and had a lot of um, good um, goals and um, action plans. Uh, and then also the local economy and housing. Um, I also found very um, interesting. And of course the land use I, I did have a question though, with all that data and statistics that you had in there, is there a plan to kind of periodically look at that and review it, maybe um, update it if there's any trends that are changing? This is Arnie, we can certainly look at those as we're doing updates. Um, that's been a commitment for an annual review and possible annual update. Mm -hmm. and we can look at those um, numbers each of those times. Um, but for a more comprehensive look at it, certainly every five years, we'll make sure that we go through and update all the data and the st statistics in there. Well, thank you. Again, I just wanted to say it's um, a lot of effort and it really shows. It's a, a great document. Arnie, does uh, most of that data come from um, Planning District Commission or national organizations? I believe Berkeley Group pulled it from a couple of different places. Certainly CSPDC, um, what's the center at UVA for population and demographics. Yeah. Well, thank, you. thank you. And, and a couple of other resources for sure. Thank you. Are we now done with the Berkeley Group? Am I correct that they are not on this call or this meeting? They are not on this call, but you will have a formal presentation okay. here. And then any, any additional information that you need um, that will be provided to you before, you know, your, to whatever you need um, in advance of that public hearing can be accomplished. Okay. I tuned in to a lot of the Planning Commission meetings where this was being discussed uh, and, and being worked on, and I was always really impressed by the in, the depth of the conversations and, and everything. But I also, even though we, of course, transitioned to all virtual back in, in March, um, what I would pick up from the Planning Commission meetings is it, it did appear that you continued to have good public engagement. I mean, now, maybe good is overstating, but I kept tuning in and hearing members of the public's comments being taken into consideration, and I thought that that was, that was excellent. Um, as this is handed off kind of to council, are there any suggestions from the Planning Commission to make sure that as we get to the goal line now that we engage, you know, for the next, you know, few weeks, a little bit more and let people read this? Because I'll tell you, you can, I mean, it's a comp plan, but honestly, if you love our city of Lexington, uh, you kind of enjoy reading it because I, I felt like the word opportunity is used so many times in the comp plan and that it almost gets you excited to some degree because there's an opportunity to do this and this and this. It was a, it was a positive document uh, in many, many aspects. Uh, one, Any suggestions? Well, David, one comment. I, I, you're right about the public comment. And we were really pleased that we kept getting those in. And we also, um, thanks to the Berkeley Group and Kelly Davis in particular, she developed a comment tracker. And that's how we systematically addressed every comment that came in and had a full discussion on them. So nothing, no stone was left unturned on any of the comments that we got. And we had considerable number of them. And that can certainly be provided to council if you want to go through the comments and they're generally um, batched by meeting and depending on what um, 
element was in front of the planning commission at the time. So you have all the comments and all of the planning commissioner's comments in one document. That and, and also um, Arnie uh, uh, and uh, Abani, they, they have a list. They, they kept a list from the get go of all of the stakeholders and citizens who were there at the beginning who gave their email addresses and, and they've just, Arnie and Bonnie have just every step of the way, you know, will send out, you know, there's a meeting coming up, this is what's going on. And I imagine that will continue so that those folks will know, you know, when you plan to have your hearing. And uh, I think that's been very helpful. So I think all of the major organizations, you know, RAC and so forth, so helpful with clean infrastructure and individuals, they're, they're getting it. So the people who have been engaged from the get go are, have been kept in the loop very well. So between that and what John was saying about the Berkeley group compiling all of that, I think that's been very helpful. Jamie. Hey, this is Jamie. Um, I think also we, ha we can't discount the impact of Facebook Live. I'm not sure how y'all's meetings have been before and after the, the, the advent of that tool. Well, uh, I think going forward, after things get however they get, uh, I would love to, for us to continue to think about how to make these meetings more accessible. I mean, now we're not only talking about distance, but also time. So we can look back tomorrow and see stuff. So hopefully we'll, there'll be lessons learned uh, from that experience. Does the Planning Commission, do you all feel that you uh, have, <laughs> have had enough time and I know it's been two years <laughs> I mean there it seemed like some things actually came onto your radar and that you dug into some topics extensively in the last few months to make the comp plan better and I just wonder if I know that again we had a timeline because we do have a contract with the consultant that has been helping us and we we do want to wrap this up but do you feel that, that, I mean, there's 51 amendments that are, you know, that the resolution uh, includes, but did you feel that you had enough time? This is Matt Tocklar. Can I say something? Please. Um, I think uh, that's a, a good point, but it also folds back into something that Pat had mentioned earlier in the, um, that this is a living document. We really intend it to be, and we've written it with being conscious of that. So if there are things that we have missed, for example, maybe we didn't get some groups, didn't have as big a voice as they might like, that is a document. This There's a way to go and modify this. This doesn't have to be every 10 years or 15 years, right? This is something that we intend to grow. With that said, maybe what, what you're speaking to, I don't know exactly what you're speaking to, but I would, I, my, my intuition is that it's about our history, the, the, the history that we're talking about and how that certainly became a big emphasis um, after, you know, in, in March or April or May of this year, and we really turned our attention and focused on that and really worked with that. We know that it was probably not an adequate job. We've done as well as we could given what we had available to us, but that won't be an adequate job for, you know, decades, right? This is going to be the thing that's going to have to keep being revisited and reworked and reconsidered as Lexington acknowledges our history and is more honesty, honest about our treatment of it. So I think this is a living document. I think that's the biggest, we're handing off something that we feel is ready to be handed off, but that is not perfect and can be changed. Camille. I'm gonna go back to David's question. Do we have enough time? <clears throat> I can't speak for all the planning commission for the full length of time that they were engaged in this. What I would say is when Berkeley Group made a staffing change to Planning Commission and we got someone who brought an A game, it was a dramatically different process. My own experience would be Planning Commission itself should never be allowed 
to solely author a comprehensive plan. You've seen the 400 page documents we produced in the past. Um, but if you get the right person to work with planning commission, we can continue to build on this. And to Matt's point, our process is now beginning October, November of every year, planning commission will undertake a review of the entire comprehensive plan. And from that, two things, lift up, actually three, lift up what projects should be prioritized for discussion with Jim. The second one to Michelle's point is decide what data needs to be updated. And then the third one, um, which would be what are the areas, and this is to Matt's point again, what are the areas that now with new information we know we need to beef up? So it's, it's an annual process and we've never done that before. Jamie. And this is Jamie, just for any of our viewers at home, there's also comp plan amendments you know, at many of our meetings. And I can't believe I'm saying this, but I'm looking forward to the first time we have to change what we just did. <laughs> is it, we just, you prove that it's a lot. So it's iterative for sure. I remember when we first were introduced to the Berkeley group and um, uh, Darren came in and was talking about the process of looking at your uh, comp plan, looking at your zoning, to make decisions on either development or things, policies in the city, and talked about how you needed to adapt those from time to time, depending upon what circumstances prevailed. And you all have done a masterful job of, in, in fact, <clears throat> making this a living document so we can work with it. You know, for instance, on page 87, in a, a question for um, uh, planning commission members, um, you talk about infill, um, Talk, did you get into any details or um, uh, specifics uh, looking at higher density housing and, and infill in particular? Arnie, do you want to take that? Or? Sure. Um, there is certainly opportunity and there are opportunity areas. So if we look on page 93 of the plan, which is what you would typically be referring to as your future land use map, and then we've sort of rebranded it as a framework, but um, then had to go back to make sure it stayed future land use map. So in your, when what's going to be new for you that Pat's already mentioned are gateway centers, um, civic corridors, but specifically opportunity areas. And those are the areas that are either vacant currently or underdeveloped. And in those areas, there's certainly an opportunity for redevelopment to increase densities and mixed use and other things. So those would be the focus areas for that infill. Uh, Don. And the other opportunity, Frank, is in um, what we've labeled as it's sensitive infill and also accessory dwellings. So right. you could incrementally increase densities within the built environment where you already have infrastructure and also expand the tax base as you do that. Um, so that you might, we might be surprised at what five units a year might do uh, over time, you know, then within five years, you'd have 25. But so that's, a, that's something that is set in here for us. That's a part of our work for the future is how we're going to do that. We've set it as a goal now that we have to figure out how with you to do it. And I, I think on the, just to pick up on the opportunity zones that Arnie mentioned, <coughs> we feel it's, I mean, the small area plans are, is one way that the city can look more holistically at some of these areas that are, that have long-term potential, development potential such as South Lexington, East Lexington, the, East, the Route 60 corridor. And you look at it more holistically in terms of potential build out there, the infrastructure needs, et cetera. And I think a case in point is your discussion around the VDOT property is one where you, would, you could do a small area study there or even a preliminary one that would look at the entire area and then you would say, what's the potential build out here What's the kind of infrastructure that we need to support and encourage private investment here? And, and that's, that's bringing a planning element into the process that um, I think would be really, really useful. Neil. And to build a little bit on what John was talking about, 
Frank, on the accessory dwellings, that's one of those things that planning commission can undertake as perhaps a catalyst project this next coming nine, 10 months, um, because it doesn't have to involve any cost to the city. But if an accessory building plan is adopted and included in the ordinances, we could see some areas, for example, that had a second story on a garage, turn those into standalone apartments so we could get some return on that investment of time pretty quickly. Excellent, thank you. Marilyn. Yes, I just wanna piggyback off of what um, David said about opportunities and so much of that was mentioned in the document. I think that there are a lot of exciting things going on in Lexington and it seems like this document reflects the excitement and the vitality even though we have COVID issues, I think there have been some exciting things going on and, and, and coming to the near future as well. Um, also, the um, inclusion um, and diversity are throughout the document and that's a good thing to see. And I think in every document, that is kind of an assumption there, but to actually see mm. it being, um, uh, commented on and to talk more about that it means that this document is inclusive and the, the people that it may refer to I'm sure will feel more part of this is for them too and I thank you for that. Thank you Marilyn. Leslie did you want to or Pat? No, no, that's okay. Go ahead, Leslie. Good. Leslie, from your uh, cat bird seat of uh, council and planning commission, any um, thoughts, suggestions, or observations to share? Sure. Well, for one, it was an outstanding process. It was a long process. We had a slow start, and part of that was because we developed our own process and format for this plan. I mean, this is uniquely Lexington with the idea of coming up with these values for each chapter in uh, having our goals and strategies based off of our core values. Um, that was something that came out of the, uh, I can remember, was the Arts and Culture or the Green Infrastructure Working Group. They, they used that format and we liked it and implemented it in all of our chapters. So it, I find it an outstanding plan from, from that perspective that it is uniquely Lexington. Uh, they also did, um, Planning Commission as a whole, looked at the strategic plan and the two plans mesh very nicely together. Um, and I think that was something very important, but the whole process went really well. Uh, it, it was a little painstaking at time, but uh, I think like Jamie said at our last meeting, dare we say it was fun as well, but it really was. And uh, I think we all feel a giant sense of accomplishment. I think one thing that um, we should look at, and, and I do also wanna thank uh, Kelly Davis and Catherine Redfern of the Berkeley Group for, um, boy, it, they did a fantastic job leading us, but especially Kelly Davis. And um, I think one of the things for council to look at as you read the whole plan and you might uh, take a, a look uh, in particular at the implementation matrix. I don't think you're going to find any issues, but those are all uh, things we would like to accomplish. So I just, I think you should look at each one item, make sure that it fit, you feel like it fits with the overall city strategy for the next 20 years, because we are somewhat committing to it um, through the comprehensive plan. And it, each, sometimes if you read those uh, strategies in the, uh, that matrix, it doesn't, if you want to see how it connects to everything, you can read at the end of the chapter, each chapter, it's repeating, it's consolidating them in the implementation matrix, but um, you can see exactly what it fits into reading it through the chapters, if that makes sense. But yeah. I just want to thank everyone on Planning Commission, the time that people spent and everybody was committed to this project. And I think the final, pro the final product really shows that. Unequivocally, the, the final product that we're uh, viewing tonight um, shows the, the passion uh, for our community and for the opportunities that are before us. 
um, I'm especially appreciative. I've been preaching uh, for quite some time, the idea of regional cooperation and figuring a way to work together. And I was elated to see that uh, frequently in, in the program as well. Um, it's one thing to um, have it in your document. Uh, now it's incumbent upon um, city officials and um, uh, city council to reach out and work with our regional partners, uh, continue to work with our regional partners to accomplish many of these things that we need to do collaboratively and together. Um, through the process, there have been many hands and certainly many voices involved in this important effort to guide our community. And uh, it's incumbent now upon city council to get it to the finish line <clears throat> for approval. Um, and then also to keep it a living document that we pull off the shelf on a frequent basis as we look to make decisions going forward. Um, from a process standpoint, um, Arnie, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, we will um, do the advertising for the public hearing to be the uh, first meeting in November. Um, timing wise, that's the earliest that we could have it on the agenda, at which time we would have a public hearing and anticipating um, uh, widespread support for this comp plan, um, city council could consider it and adopt it that evening. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, due to advertising requirements, that is the first meeting that we can make meet the advertising requirements for a public hearing. Um, but if there are concerns, questions, issues beyond tonight, I can't imagine there will be. Um, you know, council direct those uh, directly to Arnie, um, but the um, proverbial finished product uh, and resolution for us to consider on in the first uh, meeting in November, um, you should likely be able to have that available to the public and to us um, with those 51 amendments um, by the, uh, the 15th of October, is that? Yes, that can be accomplished. Okay, terrific. Um, Leslie, go ahead. Sorry, I neglected to give a shout out to Arnie and Bonnie, um, in part because they do what they always do. They're there for, they support us and they're facilitators and they're quiet about it and stand back and let planning commission shine, but that would not happen without all their hard work and all their background work that they're doing. So thank you very much to Arnie and Bonnie as well. Uh, very, very steady and, um, uh, and, and consistent, uh, getting, keeping us on track as we, we move forward. Thank you to a great staff for um, uh, supporting us and helping bring forward the great document. Marilyn. I have one question. Um, when it re referred to um, discussion about things that take place and projects that we have that go on in the city that may refer to what we're have documented in the strategic plan or what we may have documented um, in the comp plan. I'm wondering if there's something in technology that can automatically refer us to some of these parts of the comp plan and strategic plan when we have uh, something on an agenda or is that something that we just have to manually do? It might be a Berkeley group question. There must be an app for that. <laughs> there may be. I'll ask around. I'm not sure of anything other than you know, word search, that type of thing, but I can ask you to see if there's something a little bit more sophisticated than that. Okay, thank you. And Arnie, I'd encourage you to work with Janie because there may be something with our uh, new iDocs. Um, maybe we're, we're too excited and have too high of expectations, but maybe there's something embedded in there that we can take advantage of. Pat Bradley. And I also think, um, Marilyn, I hope that the way the plan is laid out and structured, that it will, will be easy when, when a project is being thought of to, to, to quickly find it, you know, and say, right, there it is, and, and that's the value, and that's why we're doing it, and that's why we're going to make a case for why it's important. I, I think it'll be easy to find these uh, in the plan. That's, that's my hope. This is Blake. It's possible. I'm not the person, but somebody in the city staff that could just turn this PDF into a, into, you know, HTML, it could just be on the website. And so you can, um, you know, go to each chapter as a separate page or, you know, that's easily, um, 
searchable for, for there. So sounds like a job for Nathan. And in, in the interim, Marilyn, just call Pat. He's been living, sleeping, uh, praying about it. So he can tell you exactly where it is. We'll put him on our speed dial. Indeed. <laughs> well, it's certainly true that technology has come a long way since the last comp plan was adopted. And so just by virtue of that, this is more accessible than the previous comp plan. And again, I wasn't a part of the previous comp plan, but I feel, I feel really good about the community engagement. And so there's a lot of fingerprints on this from a lot of people in the community and RAC is a thriving organization and they have had input into this plan and so they know what's in it. And I, I do recall that, you know, someone in the community had, I think, provided a grade for this. And it, I, want, I want to get an A on this comp plan. You know, I want some of our uh, folks in the community that, that, that have put input into this to, when it's all said and done, say, uh, the, the Planning Commission gets an A because um, a lot of folks have put, put effort into this. And I'm, I'm appreciative of that. And I'll tell you, there was something that was said that we should not lose sight of. It's, it's tying the CIP to the comp plan. And the budget process with the CIP for many years has been that we approve the CIP months and months before the budget is even approved. And the CIP usually brings forward very uh, vanilla projects that must be done, fixing a bridge, money for Moores Creek Dam, et cetera. Um, and it really will take creativity and, uh, and, and a desire to do some of the things to implement this plan. Uh, and that's gonna be on council and future councils. Uh, in my six years on council, I don't know if we've added any feet of sidewalk. And that's hard to do when we're only repairing sidewalk. Uh, and, and so that's just one example. But um, so I just, that's a challenge for us and the community to hold, hold us to that. Well, keep in mind the past 20 years, um, city councils had a priority to um, uh, renovate city hall, um, yet it still sits unrenovated. So. Um, you're absolutely right. And to that end, um, so much of it, I, I believe, is communication. And one of the things that um, I think John and I talked about uh, working towards in the future um, is that there would be two joint meetings with the Planning Commission each year, um, and strategically to have them in perhaps January and July. January to plan, see what's on the CIP, talk about priorities and shared opportunities. And then in July to see where the budget is, what's adopted and what can be completed. And, um, not wed to those dates, but they uh, matched up with um, uh, ideas that we were talking about and, and seemed to make sense. So we can certainly meet more frequently uh, if necessary, but uh, that seemed like a good plan, much like we do with the school board having a couple of meetings a year to stay connected, um, and uh, most importantly, to uh, express our appreciation for the folks that are appointed to do good work in our community like the Planning Commission. So thank, thank you all very much for the great work you do and uh, for, for getting this document to us, and we look forward to sheltering it uh, for consideration the first week in November. Um, we're at about 7.48. Is there anything else for the good of the cause this evening or um, uh, details that need to be covered? Thank you. Thank this you point, for the opportunity. We, we trade uh, reading pages, all 198 pages. Just kidding. Um, thank you all for uh, being here. And um, uh, unless there's anything else, we'll stand adjourned and City Council will reconvene in uh, 11 minutes at 8 o'clock. May I ask one thing? Yes, sir. Does John have to close our meeting? Yes. So we stand to join as the Planning Commission meeting with our joint uh, working session with the City Council. Excellent. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. All right. Pleasure. Paul, let us know if you have questions. Will do. Okay. And you're welcome to stay for the eight o'clock meeting. I promise we won't go to 11 unless council wants to. Thank you, Frank. <laughs>
And Janie, thank you for getting uh, Facebook Live up and running. Sorry, it was cantankerous there. The first part of the meeting, it was not um, broadcasted, but. It was recorded, but it just didn't go live to Facebook, but we're, we're on there now. Excellent, good work, thank you.
Janie, you frightened me there for a minute when I saw the screen go blank. I thought we'd lost everything. Thanks for keeping me on my toes. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> it, was, it was very brief. Good evening, everyone. It is the appointed hour of eight o'clock, and I'd like to call to order the Lexington City Council Thursday, October 1st, 2020 meeting. If you will all uh, please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic, the Republic for which it stands, uh, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all very much. I look forward to when we can do it in person. Next item is consideration of the agenda. And uh, I have two items I'm aware of. Uh, one um, would like to add under presentations, um, Eric Wilson for a uh, nugget of history. And um, I think uh, Mr. Ziegler, you wanted to pull 9.1, the request from Amber Anstead, um, off the consent agenda uh, for the purposes of discussion. Just a brief discussion. Certainly. Before Thanks. we approve it, just to clarify something. Very good. Um, are there any other adjustments or concerns with the agenda? Hearing none, we'll accept it, uh, approve it with those modifications. Uh, with that, um, given the summer that we had and changes that we've made uh, to uh, renaming of Oak Grove Cemetery, uh, I have been in conversations with Eric, who many of us had to learn a little bit more about the cemeteries in town and, and our history, and wanted to uh, afford our community an opportunity for a, a brief nugget of history from Eric to also coincide with the Rockbridge Historical Society. So um, Eric, I trust you're with us. I am with you. There he is, excellent. And um, I will uh, 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 just also uh, suggest that, uh, ask Eric, there's no um, uh, requirement for joining us, but from time to time we'll uh, uh, join us to provide us some uh, brief history, uh, maybe um, uh, help us understand some of the myths <clears throat> of our history and help us to be better educated and uh, knowledgeable of our community and its history. Uh, with that wonderful uh, entree, Eric, take it away. Thank you, Mayor Friedman. And uh, first of all, thank you to the council um, in general for all the hard work you're doing in a summer that's full of so many different things. Um, institutionally, uh, we appreciate the work you all committed into thinking seriously about history uh, and making sure that the community has a, has a part in that conversation. I just briefly um, wanted to note that uh, we've worked with City Manager Hallis uh, to preserve uh, the signs from uh, the Stonewall Jackson Memorial Cemetery. Uh, we're a good institution to do that uh, because we have archives, um, because we have the capacity to exhibit in different ways, uh, because they're of a size that can be reasonably shown in a way that other kinds of monumental artifacts simply aren't. Um, and we think we're also a, a kind of recognized and credible institution where people can come to understand these kinds of objects in historical contexts. And I think emphasizing contexts uh, in that plural sense of the word is really important. I think the work that uh, I know Dennis put a lot of effort into this and, and Marilyn and, and many of you and really looking at the stages through which uh, we could come to understand what function that particular site um, has held over time in different stages because it's not just been one thing. And I think now um, here in 2020 and certainly moving ahead, um, using a sign like that 
has some interesting possibilities to be able to look back to several of those moments. And I'm not going to walk through them all. Again, um, you all have got those in the files. Uh, but if you look at, you know, just several signature moments, the beginning of a church burial ground and a new community institution of the church in the 1790s, how that evolves in the 1840s with the church and the city coming to find different ways of understanding who can be buried there, you know, um, within a, a church or a community, uh, the kind of role sharing that it takes to make something like that um, viable, uh, the, the literal financial investments and the different volunteer groups there and at the Colored Cemetery on Washington Street that came into being in the late 19th century. Um, how Jackson's burial there after the Civil War and the monumental um, creation of that, that cemetery in a very new degree in the 1890s um, is another chapter that leads to 1949 in the heart of uh, the 20th century civil rights movement, which we might now uh, compare and contrast with the civil rights challenges that our country is working with uh, at present. So we got to turn that into some captions. <laughs> we, get, we get to turn those into some school programs and public programming. Uh, we have the resources to find virtual ways to do this work as well and to work with the media in telling some of these stories. So I just want to assure you as council um, that our board that agreed to accession these and sees this very much within our mission uh, to preserve and promote the, the histories of Rockbridge County, uh, we'll do that within, uh, in conjunction with a, a range of other community histories ahead. Um, the, the chapter is not closed on this. Um, it opens and, and moves in different directions. And um, I'll just close by saying that, um, as Mayor Friedman says, we want to be a resource to provide uh, information uh, to open questions from the public, um, certainly from civic bodies like Planning Commission we work with as well this summer in developing that comprehensive plan in the history section. Um, and with an election coming up, uh, there, we've got an interesting uh, article we're working on developing about the first vote in 1867 uh, for black men in Rockbridge and across the state, um, about an 80 to 90 percent uh, turnout um, of that cohort that I think can help us see how a community evolves and, and continues to evolve. So uh, we'll see how that evolves into a nugget or an article or, or something of the sort. But um, overall, I'm happy to field any questions or, or do so by email. Uh, but thank you again. It, it's a community um, that is committed to histories in a, in a lot of different ways. And um, your leadership's been a, important in, in signaling that. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate you being with us and uh, getting us started with our first nugget and um, many opportunities in, into the future. So um, greatly appreciate and look forward to future uh, nuggets of education as we move forward. So uh, thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is uh, public hearings, public hearing and consideration of emergency declaration and ordinance AIR 6.1. Um, I will uh, observe that uh, the consideration of it is listed under new business of 15.1. And unless there's an objection uh, after the public hearing would like to uh, offer it for council's consideration. Is there any objection to that? Hearing none, I would like to open the public hearing. Janie, is there anyone who has zoomed in or uh, written in about this topic? I don't have either uh, comments or anybody asking to speak to you. Very good. I'll just uh, make the observation that uh, we're um, doing, doing this as an abundance of caution and uh, carrying on uh, the business of the city, uh, but we all are eager to work towards uh, meeting in person and moving beyond the emergency and certainly the pandemic. Um, with that, I would ask for council's consideration, or let me close the public hearing. Um, and then ask for council's consideration of uh, the emergency declaration and ordinance. I move to approve the resolution confirming the city manager's declaration of a local emergency and the ordinance. Thank you, Leslie. Second. 
I'm going to put that one on David. Um, and uh, all in favor of approval of the uh, ordinance or the emergency declaration signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, next item is consideration of minutes. Have uh, August 20, September 3rd work session and uh, regular uh, meeting and uh, would welcome your consideration of those minutes. I move that we approve the minutes as presented. Thank you, Dennis. Second. Thank you, Marilyn, with a second. Any discussion? Just recognize and appreciate Janie's work to get those uh, detailed and presented um, to us in a timely manner. Uh, all in favor of approval of the minutes as presented signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, motion carries unanimously. Uh, next item is citizen remarks and comments. And um, Janie has those, I think. There they are. And um, if I'm thinking correctly, Marilyn, you're, you're our first reader this evening. Okay, this first one is from Andrew Wildman. Greetings. I will keep this short and to the point. You are well aware of both sides of the argument regarding the cemetery name change. So I will not rant or give you my perspective. I am very displeased with the decision regarding the name change. It is the council's right to do this and I am only an outsider from the state of Pennsylvania. I have visited Lexington one or two weekends a year for the past 20 years because I love the rich history and its beauty. I just want you to understand a small direct impact of the very poor decision to cave to the mob and a national frenzy. My family will no longer visit or spend money in Lexington, Virginia. I have several other Civil War and history buff friends who will also not visit Lexington anymore. It is a shame and may seem minuscule or an overreaction to you, but we need to stand somewhere. If the council changes its course in the future, we will return. Thanks, A.W. This uh, message is from Anna Rosamilia. Uh, Dear City Council, I recently moved into the area and part of the reason was the history and the charm of the area. I feel changing the name of Stonewall Jackson Cemetery, street names, etc., serves no purpose. They are only words. But what it will do is change part of the historic charm of the area and subsequently tourism in the region, not to mention the cost incurred in doing so. If a name changes what you want, at least let the people voice their opinion by voting. Thank you for allowing me to voice my opinion. Thank you, Anna Rosamelia, Natural Bridge. Uh, this is uh, from Cheryl Nestor. Council has been asked to waive the vendor's license for an October 3rd event in Hopkins Green. This event is a women's community festival held from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. celebrating the 100th anniversary of women's right to vote. It is a nonpartisan women's community festival in celebration of the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. At the event, there will be displays and stage programs of interest to women, ranging from self-defense to health and relaxation to freedom and finances. Our primary speaker is a dynamic woman from Roanoke, Tori Mabry, who has had significant impact on foster care funding. During the event, there will be also there will also be nonpartisan voter registration. Purpose of this email is to, re to request a vendor's license. We would like to have participants' items of interest available for sale, scented soaps and miscellany, as well as any food vendors that already have a seller's license and commercial kitchen. Would council please approve a vendor's license for the event? While sponsored by the Women of the Rockbridge Area Republican P Committee, this is a nonpartisan event. Thank you for your consideration as we celebrate an important milestone in the history of women's rights. With appreciation, 
Women's Celebration Planning Committee. Thank you, council members, for reading those into the minutes. Um, Janie, is there anyone else who Zoomed in or requested to speak this evening? That was all I had. Terrific. Uh, we always welcome citizens' comments and um, uh, invite people to join us on Zoom if they'd like to uh, uh, present information to council uh, and thus the community. Um, and uh, thank you for the folks that did write in. Right. Uh, the next Frank, yes. would it be worth noting that we did receive a number of letters regarding recycling as well? Um, I was going to address that under my um, mayor's report, but yes. Okay. De definitely worth noting. Um, the next item on the agenda is the consent agenda, and uh, we're pulling the first, so 9.2 would be for your consideration. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. Thank you, David. I'm going to give Dennis the, the tie on that one and um, ask for a roll call vote. Ms. Alexander? Aye. Ms. Ayers? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Ms. Hentz? Aye. Mr. Ziegler? Aye. Ms. Strong? Aye. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, we have the other request uh, from Amber Anstead uh, that's been pulled and ask for your consideration on that. Uh, for, to get us to the purpose of discussion. Sure, make a motion that we approve the request to close Jackson uh, on 31 October uh, for the purpose of trick-or-treating. Second. Thank you, Michelle, for the second. Mr. Ziegler. Uh, no, I just wanted to clarify because typically the city does not have private citizens closing public streets. Uh, for, for activities. Typically a private citizen might apply for a street closure uh, in conjunction with an organization. And so I would just ask and wanted to take the advice of our interim city manager to make it very clear that if we approve this street closure, that in the interest of public safety, the city manager has the right to either uh, change the terms of the street closure or change the street closure to a different day. And you might recall this, we went through this last year and it was not clear and we uh, tripped over ourselves for several days uh, when we were staring down a hurricane and, and some horrible weather and we were, we were unable to move the date of a street closure. Uh, and so I would just uh, like to point that out so that we are all on the same page that Jim has the opportunity to confer with public safety officials and to make adjustments to this street closure if needed. Thank you, David. Any other discussion? Uh, hearing none, ask for a roll call vote. Mr. Smith? Aye. Ms. Strong? Aye. Ms. Ayers? Aye. Mr. Ziegler? Aye. Ms. Hentz? Aye. Ms. Alexander? Aye. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you all very much. I'm not aware of any unfinished business to address this evening. And that takes us to boards and commissions in the Blue Ridge Resource Authority. Mr. Smith. Uh, briefly, I just got an email confirming our account uh, with the uh, Virginia Investment Pool. So that box has been checked so we can start getting a little better return on the money so what we have uh, for long-term um, closure down the road. Thank you. Any questions? Very good. Um, hearing no questions, Ms. Strong, Main Street, Lexington. Yeah, uh, today is the start of the science fair. So for those, I, those folks who signed up for the kits ahead of time, they were available for pickup mm -hmm. today. And if you didn't sign up for your kids, and but you're still interested in doing some activities, you can go to the MainStreetLexington.org website and they have some uh, suggestions for online activities. And um, don't forget about trick-or-treating downtown as well. We have on Saturday, October 31st, we're gonna change it up this year and trick-or-treating will go from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. 
for participating businesses in hopes of spreading out the number of trick-or-treaters we have and it also gives you plenty of time to go uh, visit the businesses too and uh, buy and pick up candy while you're do doing it while you're shopping downtown and then the walker entrepreneurship program that we've talked about it's a uh, building and supporting uh, black indigenous people of color businesses in rockridge county you can um, if you're interested in starting your own business you can sign up for the walker program it'll bring um, training and support for for those people interested in starting businesses and you can uh, email the walkerprogram.com to get more information and that's all i have thank you leslie any questions i'll just say that um I, I think main street lexington assisted with the project but it is well worth 15 minutes of your time to watch a the video about the gardens uh in throughout lexington and the, and the hanging plants on main street and downtown uh that video is excellent and i guarantee that every citizen will learn something if they watch that video about our our beautiful city and, and the beautiful gardens and plants and the people that maintain them is that video on the city website or main street website it is all over facebook um, I don't know if it's on the city's website. It's, it's in our newsreel on the homepage. Great. Terrific. Thank you, Janie. And um, <clears throat> a debt of gratitude um, to the Youngs who I think shot it and uh, edited it. So um, uh, kudos to them and um, to the many people who uh, came together to make that video and represent our city so well. Thank you, David. Planning Commission, Ms. Strong. Sure, we met last Thursday and it was nice to have a, more of a, one of our typical meetings we haven't had in a while where we just handled some business. Uh, we had two, two items to act on. We had a, um, a, a CUP, first we had an application for replacing the Shul sign and uh, we approved that. And then we had a CUP for a, con a conditional use permit for a, bed and breakfast on Main Street, and that'll come before council at our next meeting. Um, we also had a presentation from Jake Adams, our finance director, about the CIP, so we, so planning commissions can start learning how, how that process works so that we can be a part of it and make sure that the comprehensive plan is taken into consideration when making decisions about the CIP. And then we also had a really good discussion about uh, the use of Facebook during our meetings. And I did pass on a note to council about this, just something for us to consider. We, um, planning commission's meetings are on Facebook Live, just like the city council meetings are. And uh, we have used that successfully in um, when we were presenting the comprehensive plan and getting comment from the public, uh, Jamie Gooden was, was checking the, the comments on Facebook and uh, we were addressing those as needed since it was an informal process. And we got into discussion about, is it appropriate to respond to Facebook um, during a formal meeting when in, um, and at other times? And uh, we felt like it probably isn't. We didn't make a formal decision on it, but we did refer it to, Arnie was gonna check with Jared to, to find out more information about that. And we have the same situation on council, so it's worth considering. For council as well and that's all i have any questions for leslie uh let's have just um uh thank you for bringing up the issue of facebook um certainly <clears throat> the technology that we're making use of in the uh, virtual meetings uh, are under the emergency uh, declaration and at some point that'll be lifted uh, we'll be required to go back in um, place but i hope that uh, Jared will be able to advise us on some best practices in utilizing Facebook, um, certainly to engage the community and uh, find ways to, to work collaboratively uh, with the state. Being a Dillon Rule state, we can only do what uh, the, the state allows us to do. And right now we're able to, to make use of such things and um, look forward to uh, making full use of technology as we progress uh, through, through the coming uh, meetings and sessions. Regional Tourism Board, Mr. Ayers. Yeah, um, the Tourism Board won't meet again until Wednesday, October 14th, but I did have a couple items I wanted to mention tonight. First, uh, the Friends of the Chessie Trail is sponsoring their annual Run the Chessie Race, 
and you can sign up for a marathon or a half marathon or a 5k and to assure proper social distancing this year once you register you can run your race anytime between october 16th and november 1st and registration is only fifteen dollars and all proceeds from the event will be used by friends of the chessie trail for future trail improvements and if you want more info and sign up you can go to runthechessie.org um, if you're looking for something to do this weekend or in the near future, you might consider a visit to the Brownsburg Museum for their Cradle to Coffin, Remembering the Country Store exhibit. Visitors will find themselves immersed in the sensory experience of a country store. The front room of the museum will have traditional museum interpretive panels explaining the rise and fall of rural retail business, as well as displaying historic store artifacts and old photographs from area country stores. Um, Cradle of the Coffin will be at the Brownsburg Museum through December 31st, and museum visits can be arranged in advance to groups of 10 people or fewer by calling Julie Fox at 774-279-9742. And the tours are free, and they last no more than an hour. And finally, I wanted to give a shout out to the Project Horizon fundraiser at Hull's Drive-In on October 25th. They will be showing Intimate Violence, a documentary, uh, this is an original film produced by Washington Lee Assistant Professor Stephanie Sandberg and Washington Lee Junior Nolan Zunk. The documentary features local, statewide, and national experts on domestic violence, as well as the stories of survivors and the violence they've endured. And fundraiser donations are $100 per car with proceeds going to Project Horizon. And uh, that's all I have tonight. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Any questions for Dennis? Very good. Uh, Department of Social Services, Ms. Hentz. I have no report. Our next board meeting will be meeting on the 21st. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Raro, Mr. Uh, no report. We'll be meeting next Wednesday. Terrific. Threshold, Ms. Alexander. No report. We'll meet on October 20th. It's going to be a busy later of the month. Yes. Here's committee, Mr. Ziegler. Uh, Leslie, myself, uh, Jake, and Jim met on Monday, and we talked about uh, the Phase Two funding from the CARES Act, which is approximately another six hundred forty-nine thousand six hundred thirty-five dollars. Mm. Uh, we have uh, remaining from Phase One uh, one thousand four hundred and thirty-five dollars. So in total. That's six hundred fifty-one thousand and seventy dollars that we need to allocate uh, by thirty December, I believe. Uh, we have been the recipient of conflicting interpretations of what are allowable uses and not allowable uses from the federal government, uh, but we think that they have settled on some allowable uses now. Uh, but they have been all over the place a little bit, and luckily Jake is tracking all of that. And, and so we feel really fortunate that, that Jake and Jim are on top of what we can and cannot do with those funds. Um, at our last meeting, I believe we talked about uh, allocating some funds immediately for our schools. And that continues to be a priority. And as we look to this $650,000 uh, or approximately 37,000 of that is what we essentially appropriated to the schools immediately, a couple weeks ago. Um, going forward, we believe that it's in our best interest to set aside about $60,000 for additional uses at our schools. Uh, and so that, um, that's a number that we feel uh, pretty good about uh, for, for our schools. Additionally, as we look towards the next couple months, we would like to again uh, utilize the IDA uh, and Main Street Lexington to provide uh, business support grants, if you will, recovery grants to businesses within the city of Lexington. We believe that the first round of about $129,000, $130,000 that was allocated through the IDA and Main Street Lexington was effective and needed. And we believe that again, this late fall, we should allocate $130,000 to support the businesses that support us. Uh, and, and so that's a big chunk of the money that we have no qualms about recommending to all of council. Uh, we also uh, 
something that we talked about previously was allocating money to the police department for facility modifications. And we believe that those modifications to the entry of the police department are gonna cost about $6,797, uh, roughly. Uh, and so we would like to keep that in mind of the 651,000. Uh, Jake and Jim have also continued to, to, to keep their ears open on what our um, regional partners uh, or regional agent, the agencies that we partner uh, with, our, with the county and BV to support. For example, that might be uh, the jail, uh, it might be the courthouse, whatever they might need. Uh, and so we believe that those regional agencies are gonna need about $40,855. And we talked about that previously, you might, might recall. And then our committee uh, would very much like to recommend that we utilize funding from the CARES Act uh, to provide uh, hazard pay bonuses to full-time police, fire, and EMS employees uh, in the amount of $2,000. Uh, we would like to do that. That is something that is certainly being done uh, locally amongst other, um, you know, some of our regional partners. And we are excited that we would like to do that also to uh, acknowledge and, and, and show our appreciation, obviously, for the folks that take care of us and never missed a beat as we entered this new reality. And we believe that in total, that could total about $74,000 uh, to provide those bonuses. Uh, and then lastly, we would like to uh, do something similar to what we did in round one of the uh, phase or phase one of the CARES Act funding is that we would again like to reimburse the city for the expenses incurred in the form of salaries or mainly salaries, but it could be other expenses incurred for COVID related, um, for, for time spent on COVID related issues. Those salaries could be the finance director, they could be the city manager, they could be all uniformed city police and fire department, it could be. But that's our recommendation to go ahead and allow our finance director to report out our uses of the funds to remove that administrative burden that might be on him if we didn't do that, if we left money unappropriated further into the fall. And so that we believe that that is certainly an allowable use that is, and we believe that that is in the best interest of, of Lexington right now. So I would, uh, that's brief overview. Uh, I can take any questions or certainly Leslie, Jim, Jake, please chime in if you have anything to add or if I missed anything, if I, if I misspoke. Thank you, David. Um extremely uh, thorough and very important that we work cooperatively um, and in sync with our municipal partners, uh, County and Buena Vista <clears throat> through this bizarre COVID time. Um, Jake, Jim, anything to add or observations? Uh, sure, well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I just wanna add on David's last point, um, you know, as far as payroll expense reimbursement, this is something that's been discussed heavily by all the localities in Virginia. I've uh, been following it very carefully for the last several months. Um, within the CARES Act guidance, there is an, an administrative presumption that um, payroll expenses in the form of salary and fringes for public health and safety employees are presumed to be dedicated substantially to COVID-19 response. So in that regard, the city is, is free to reimburse itself for already budgeted payroll costs for these employees uh, in the time period from March 1st to December 30th. Additionally, other um, employees whose payroll expenses have been um, substantially diverted to COVID response um, may also um, utilize those expenses for reimbursement as well. There's more documentation that's required for, for those expenses. As I said, public health and safety employees are presumed to be dedicated to COVID, um, other employees who have been diverted to COVID will have to have additional documentation to support that. But this is um, something that most all localities throughout Virginia are doing. And this allows reimbursement to the city of funds that were already budgeted for, for payroll expenses to come back to our general fund uh, that, that we can then use for other purposes. 
Um, so I think this is a great use of great use of the funds within the allowable guidance that we have on the CARES Act. Thank you, Jake. <clears throat> Any other questions from members of council? Very good. I just have a quick question. Sure. So for the wages, do you have to have, just in case you had an audit, uh, some kind of documentation for those COVID related activities or is it just, you know, you're just gonna say like a certain percentage or, or they, do you have to have time and effort reporting available just in case? Uh, the latest guidance that we've received from the treasury is that for public health and safety employees, the only documentation is actual expenses from the ledger. So tying the, the amount we're claiming for reimbursement to expenses that we've actually paid out um, for salary and fringes. Um, for, and and those, are, those are the only documentation requirements. There's no requirement that we have to um, you know, estimate or describe what COVID related duties that they've undertaken. They are presumed to be dedicated to COVID. And as I said, for other employees outside of public health and safety, that would require additional documentation, um, a log of COVID related duties, an estimation of percentage of time spent on COVID. So there are, are differing requirements depending on the, the classification of the employee. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jake. Anything else? Uh, great. A great deal of um, gratitude to uh, David and Leslie for um, embarking and working with staff on this meaty task of um, how to spend money that has lots of strings and restrictions and circumstances. So we're all very grateful for your, your time and talents in um, getting this allocated and supporting the businesses and our uh, students in the community. Thank you all. Uh, next item is my report. Um, um. Right, before we move along, can I add one thing to Dennis's report before we get to your report? Please. Uh, Britain Natural Bridge State Park installed uh, some love letters down at Natural Bridge State Park. I wanted to get that in uh, for you all to know. Uh, the de dedication was Friday, um, despite the rain. It was a, a pretty strong turnout. Uh, made some local news. So when you get the opportunity, take a, take a ride down there and, and check out that new, new installation. It's getting a lot of... Uh, it's getting a lot of traction. When uh, we went down there Saturday, we actually ran into a family that had traveled here from Virginia Beach for the day uh, just to go see the Natural Bridge. So it, it, it highlights the, the success that Jim Jones and, and the French Natural Bridge State Park are, are having down there. So I'm gonna give, give that plug in. Yeah, thank you. Chuck, thank you for mentioning that. Hey, one question for you. Um, the, the the current where it's now installed is that the permanent location for for, for the for, for the uh barring any sort of seismic activity uh yes those those letters are going nowhere the, there's uh, quite a bit of of concrete uh, i understand i understand you helped mark klein move move that thing on that rainy day how far did you have to move it Thursday wasn't too bad. Um, the installation went went smoothly. Uh, we had enough hands and, and bodies and shovels uh, to make it happen with with very little. Um, it went smoothly. Uh, the rain we we got on on Friday, but we had a gap of some drizzle when the actual dedication was made before and after. It, it was uh, it was coming down pretty heavy, so someone was was helping us out with uh, the precipitation levels uh, when, when the trigger had to get pulled. Uh, but, but to answer the question is, those letters are not going anywhere right now. Okay. Jim. Mr. Mayor, uh, was uh, Council Member Sigler report going to be accepted by City Council in the form of a motion tonight, or are we going to delay some action on that? Um, if you'd like some action on that, we can certainly uh, take his report as a motion and somebody can second it if that would be helpful. Second. Thank you, Chuck. Any discussion? Uh, hearing none, ask for a roll call vote. Mr. Smith? Aye. Ms. Strawn? Aye. Mr. Ziegler? Aye. Mr. Ayers? Aye. Ms. Pence? Aye. Ms. Alexander? Aye. A, a unanimous vote for you, Mr. City Thank Manager. You, Mr. Mayor. Gladly, gladly. 
Um, and again, a great deal of thanks for everyone's efforts in um, spending unbudgeted money uh, in, in such a uh, positive fashion. Um, Segwaying back to uh, Chuck and, and the love story, um, the Friends of Natural Bridge State Park are still accepting uh, new members. So if you're so inclined, um, you will get invitations and uh, knowledge of things like the love uh, going in <clears throat> and highly recommend you uh, show some support of our um, southern neighbors down there in Natural Bridge. Uh, for my report, um, first on a, a sad note, um, I'm remiss in, in not acknowledging this at the beginning, but um, uh, Lexington community lost a, a pioneer uh, in Louise Moore who passed away. You may have seen in the News Gazette um, reported yesterday. Um, terrific lady who served on city council and did uh, many things in our community and uh, would refer you to her obituary to uh, detail those, but uh, please keep her family. Uh, they were um, multi-generation here in Lexington and a, a terrific lady that um, uh, did, did many, many positive things with uh, HLF and um, uh, uh, in the law and in our community and serving on city council. So I wanted to recognize her service to our community. Along the lines of recognizing service to our community, as you all are aware, Mark Riley has um, made indication of his retirement and remind everyone that his retirement party will be at Jordan's Point uh, next Friday, or two Fridays, October 16th. Um, so just wanted to remind everyone of that. And also um, uh, when you um, have the opportunity, when you see Mark or go out of your way to see him, um, express your gratitude for his 27 years of service to our community. And lastly, as uh, Leslie alluded to earlier, we've um, heard from many people who um, are becoming uh, recycling hoarders, it sounds like. Um, with the absence of our re curbside recycling and no alternative, uh, folks are still collecting things and um, want to assure people that we're working diligently to find a solution, working with our uh, friends in the county um, and for a short-term um, solution. <clears throat> but also, um, I've uh, asked Chuck to lead a recycling committee um, and inviting uh, Ray York of the Blue Ridge Resource Authority, uh, Daniel Meyer with the county recycling effort, um, our staff, uh, representative of RDS, and Scott Dittman from uh, the community at large uh, to meet and look at the current state of recycling, uh, single stream that we had embarked upon uh, just before seemingly the market collapsed, um, and to ascertain and come back with a recommendation to council of the, the best way to move forward short term and long term. Um, an important thing to know is that we're concerned about supporting our community, we're concerned about our environment and concerned about our globe and uh, doing the things well that we've done in the past. Um, COVID, we were very aggressive with our budget cutting, which included uh, the recycling uh, because of the significant costs associated with um, the end result for the most part uh, going to the landfill uh, at this juncture. So look forward to the, the work that they will do um, and uh, ask council members if you have any reflections or other observations. Um, but uh, folks that have uh, sent in your letters, we certainly hear you and I can assure you that we're working expeditiously to uh, find a solution to provide recycling in our community. A, a quick reminder, uh, auto recyclers over in BV is still accepting metals. Uh, so if you have a lot of cans piling up, now you know where to, one, one outlet is. Um, uh, aluminum and tin cans? Uh, I think it just said metals. So I'm presuming, yeah, mostly aluminum and, and, uh, and food cans. Clean them out. Very good. Thank you, Chuck. Um, there's nothing else on the recycling topic. I'll bounce past to the city manager for his report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I wanted to spend a little time on some of the issues I've been uh, dealing with on utility bills and the request for refunds. In the last several months, I've received a number of requests for refunds and high utility bills due to leaks in the customer's home or business plumbing or facilities. Our utility fund is operated as an enterprise fund and enterprise funds like a business must generate revenue sufficient to cover the expenses of the fund. 
The four most recent requests I've received for relief in the last month or so were for $3,000 plus, $3,500, $600 plus, and $60. Since revenues must be generated to cover expenses, and we must also set aside money aside for water main and sewer line replacements, any costs not paid by one customer are borne by the rest of our customers. With approximately 2,700 utility customers, these four requests alone would require all their customers to have their bills increased by $2.65 for a single billing period to make up that revenue. And these are, the only, these are only the requests that came to me as city manager. There are a number of other requests that go to public works and do not appear on my desk. City policies have been put in place to protect customers who carefully manage their water use and watch their properties. These policies seek to assure that all costs are recovered from each customer and the average customer is not paying the cost of customers who are less diligent. So what should customers do to prevent leaks from going unnoticed? The city has purchased and makes available for free the census customer portal. All customers can get online and easily sign up for this service or call the Department of Public Works for assistance in doing so. The census system will monitor your water usage and notify you immediately if a high water use is detected. This gives you the customer timely, timely notice to check your toilet, sinks, pipes, and hoses to see where your water may be running, saving you from an expensive bill. So please sign up today. I would also note that to con continue to better serve our customers and community, other options are also being evaluated, and these measures will be forthcoming in the very near future. Uh, to further elaborate on the mayor's report, I have also followed up on some of the other possible recycling options. First, I'm happy to say Rockbridge County has been contacted, and I believe the county is considering making some alternatives available to the city and city residents. However, everyone should know that Rockbridge County is not required to extend any proposals, and should they choose to do so, it is because they have always been positive, professional, and collaborative in their relationship with the city. Further, any proposals that may be, before, any proposals that may be forthcoming does not mean that in any way the Rockbridge County extended proposal that does not cover their cost. We must all pay our share. Also, after the recent news that the city of Covington has concluded what appears to be a very beneficial recycling agreement for its residents, I have reached out to the Covington city manager. She and I will be meeting soon to go over the details of what their agreement delivered to their community. <clears throat> also like to note that uh, tomorrow, Jeff Martone and I will be meeting with the friends of Brushy Hills to discern what roles these highly engaged and energetic folks can fill in the continuing preservation and recreational uses of this special site. While I anticipate a very fruitful conversation, I also have noted to the group that there are some I's to dot and T's to cross, and they're very important to both that group and the city. Of course, we would have some liability and safety issues involved should the friends take action or make decisions as, how to site, how, as to how the site may be used. We also may have issues as to what legal authority have been granted to the friends to take actions on our behalf, and similarly, can they actually take any enforcement actions? So while the goals and visions of this group is self-evident and overwhelmingly positive for all, we just have a few naughty issues to deal with. Um, following up on the many conversations we've had about the Sarah's Run Interceptor and the INI that we all know is <clears throat> occurring there, DPW Director Jeff Martone and Finance Director Jake Adams have continued to study possible actions and outcomes for dealing with the current lack of capacity in the Sarah's Run Interceptor. While we, have, while we have had and still do have plenty to do during the first quarter of the year, staff would like to present some plans for action to be sure that we do permit ourselves the opportunity to consider possible alternatives. I believe a work session may be best used to continue this discussion. While I know the council has had a number recently, I would like to ask the council consider a work session for this matter on either November 15th or 19th. And of course, I'll take any questions. Staff and I can answer any questions you might have regarding the need for this, but I don't believe it's um, helpful to let this uh, issue uh, linger when we know there are some possibilities out there for moving ahead. Schools financial planning. I had sat down with school superintendent Rebecca Walters and financial manager Tommy Roberts to discuss the continuing financial impacts of COVID-19, possible uses of CARES funds, and a very preliminary look at the fiscal year 22 budget, actually. Not only do the schools continue to put in place measures and actions to account for the impacts of COVID safely and get our children back into the classroom, 
but they are also carefully tracking and monitoring their financial condition. Superintendent Walters reminded me that the school still had some previously required CARES funds used, requested I should say, CARES funds uses that they would like to see the considered, and that she and her staff will carefully consider other thoughts and additional needs. She also noted that with fewer students enrolled in the schools, they have been tracking revenue losses and will be closely monitoring and reported changes to the school board and city council. They're optimistic a number of children who are not currently enrolled now will come back to the schools when they open their classrooms for in-person instruction. Since they are early in the fiscal year, just as we are, projections for additional funding that may re be required from city council are not yet available, but it is being carefully reviewed and more information will be made available at the school board city council work session on, on October 15th. Also like to note a very uh, significant activity recently that the fire department had participated in. And this last Sunday night, the department while assisting the Rockbridge, Rockbridge County Sheriff's located two children who wandered away from their home late at night. And uh, these children were safe, but had to be found by those public safety agencies. So kudos to our fire department, police department, and all of our sub uh, public safety partners in the region. Uh, finally, another uh, area I think we should all be pleased with is the efficiency of our uh, staff with regard to working again with our community partners. Uh, recently this week, the city attorney and Jeff Martone and his staff worked on an efficiency request for Washington Lee University. Of course, WNL owns or is responsible for utility bills at numerous locations within the city. At the request of WNL and through the excellent customer service of the DPW staff, WNL will now receive a single utility bill for all their accounts, and DPW will only have to issue and track a single invoice. Um, another matter with WNL is that they are undertaking a traffic study this week and next, and this comes as a result of the questions that were, that were raised when reviewing the draft WNL master plan. WNL is taking the initiative to have a traffic study conducted around their campus and in the downtown this week and next. And that's what I have. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Jim. Any questions for the city manager? Uh, maybe two. Related to the uh, traffic study at WNL, how reliable will those numbers be um, in the midst of, uh, of this COVID pandemic well, that's going to affect all sorts of vehicular traffic? Uh, I'm sort of concerned about uh, the results of that. And the, my second question goes back to the utility bill um, problems that, that we're facing. And you mentioned that there are several requests that, that go directly to public works. Um, any idea what happens, you know, that don't make it to your desk, what, what happens with those requests? Well, some are rejected because they clearly do not meet city policy. Uh, some uh, are approved for that very same reason, especially the smaller request for a refund. Um, you know, you get, you get various circumstances when a resident has the opportunity and certainly is due a refund, uh, depending on the type of leak in particular. Some cannot be seen at all if they're below the foundation or in the lines going to the street. Um, others that should be seen, like in your bathtub or in your toilet or in the hose laying out in the yard, those, frankly, are probably most cases rejected because we do expect customers to watch their homes and their businesses so that they and we don't face that kind of loss. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Very good. Thank you, Jim. Turn our attention to the city attorney, Jared. Just a brief reminder that we have uh, arguments scheduled for next Thursday at 3 p.m. in the circuit court on the Enfield Road water tower property to determine um, what the city's uh, right to that parcel is, um, given the restrictions in the deed. Um, I'm hopeful that that will be the last hearing and we will get some sort of final order coming out of that one way or the other. Um, so hopefully that will be tied up fairly soon. Um, and then secondly, to Leslie's issue with the Planning Commission and Facebook comments, I've been working with Arnie and Janie to sort of get a better understanding of what's technically possible, both um, sort of broadly speaking, as well as what we've been doing currently and what we might be able to do in the future um, to really pinpoint 
what will hopefully be an overall best practices for both the planning commission and the city council um, going forward, both under meetings under the emergency ordinance, as well as um, going forward when we return to normal. So um, that's something that we're working on and we'll hopefully have recommendations, um, if not by the next council meeting um, soon thereafter. And that's all I have. Any questions for Jared? Uh, Jared, one quick question I have. Um, uh, assuming the court uh, finds in our favor next Thursday after your arguments, um, what's the timing? Um, my, my hope is that Edwin is chomping at the bit to get started on the Enfield Road uh, water tower project. Um, what, what's the timing look like with that? I know generally we've been keeping him updated um, and have let him know that we are hopeful that we will have a final resolution on our end next week. And he is certainly sort of interested to obviously find out what that becomes. Um, so he has not given any indication that he has lost interest in the project generally. Um, but as far as timing and their work schedules and what they're able to do with um, sort of colder weather coming on, we haven't gotten into those details yet, but I imagine we will um, hopefully soon after next Thursday. But next Thursday should wind up and clear the title to move forward with that sale. <clears throat> or go the other way and put the property back on the city's tax rolls. Gotcha. Very good. Uh, good luck and uh, thank you for your efforts on behalf of the city. Uh, next item is new business, considering the resolution authorizing the advanced refunding of our series 2013 VRA bonds. Um, Jake, did you want to speak to this? Yes, I did. Uh, <clears throat> thanks again, Mr. Mayor. Um, so tonight for council's consideration, we do have a uh, resolution authorizing entry into the uh, VRA fall 2020 financing pool for advanced refunding of our series 2013 uh, bonds. Um, from the results of our discussion at our last uh, council meeting, um, it was uh, determined to move forward with um, some updated analysis and a um, mentioning in the resolution that we would like to reserve a minimum of 7% savings uh, on this refunding opportunity if we do decide to go forward and enter the, the financing pool. Um, so attached with the agenda summary, we do have the updated uh, refunding analysis performed by Davenport um, since our last meeting. And, and we also have R.T. Taylor from Davenport, again, present with us tonight. So thanks to him for being available. Um, he has prepared uh, an updated analysis. Uh, I believe there was a request at the last meeting um, to prepare a market sensitivity analysis that um, included a 7% minimum savings amount and what that looked like with the annual uh, debt service schedule. And um, additionally, to uh, compare that to our front-loaded savings approach that we are requesting to go forward with. Um, this would yield the greatest savings over the remaining years of the bond issue in fiscal years 21 and 22. Um, it is worth noting that um, since the updated analysis was performed, our, our previous um, estimate for savings was at 9.23%. That has fluctuated down some uh, slightly since our last meeting to 8.83%. So some minimal loss in savings due to market fluctuations in the time uh, in the last two weeks. Um, with that, I will open it to any questions, but first I would like to um, speak to RT and, and uh, see if he would like to um, give a, a quick summary of his updated analysis uh, to council based upon the request to provide that updated sensitivity analysis. So RT, if you're with us, um, if you'd like to run through that uh, analysis for us, please. Certainly, and uh, I guess, Jake, would you like for me to share my screen with the presentation? Would that be helpful? Or do you uh, want me to? Certainly, that, that is possible. Uh, Janie, I don't know if you can give RT that capability. Hold on one second for me to stop sharing mine. Okay, thank you. Okay, try it now. All right.
All right, let's see. It does not like me this evening. <laughs> All right. Um, as Jake said, we're good evening, everybody. Thank you for having us be available this evening to talk through the update. Um, overall, big picture, um, rates are still very favorable. Um, we, we've only seen a little bit of movement in the market. We did run a couple of the other sensitivities to give some perspective. So not to belabor the presentation, I'm just going to jump to, um, I don't know, Jake, do they have the presentation in front of them as we send it, or is it different page numbers in the agenda package? Jamie could put that up from her packet. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm not quite sure why I can't share my screen this evening. Our, our, I, I think we're on page nine. Is that your refunding analysis sensitivity targets? Gotcha. Okay, yes, thank you. So if we go down to page nine, this is the page where um, we added a few more data points trying to get to that appropriate level to show some perspective on where you would like your savings to come in at a minimum and 7% present value there on line five under column C was uh, sort of discussed uh, at length at the last meeting. And it's also the parameter that's been included in your resolution this evening, but it's in brackets because you can change it. Um, we checked with bond council and you're able to change it. But for now, that seemed to be um, the consensus, at least from last time. Um, and what you see on page nine, again, is the level savings. If you were to just structure this and solve for level uh, budgeted cash flow savings in a given fiscal year going forward for the rest of the life, uh, the current market is roughly 45000 a year. 7% uh, would generate roughly $35,000 per year. Um, if you turn the page, and again, I'm gonna focus on columns B and C. B is current market, which yields roughly 8.83% uh, present value savings there on line five. And on line uh, five under column C, that's our where we're solving for what it would look like if we dropped or rates went against us and the results were at 7% present value. And I think you can see there that you're still able to pull up close to, well, it's over $400,000 if you're adding 21 and 22 together. Right. Terrific. And RT is the, um, the pricing date, is that uh, still October 28th? That's correct. Okay. And if we're at 6.99, we'll pull it and be out. Otherwise, 7% uh, percent or higher of net present value will be in. And um, our resolution, I think, um, our preference is the um, uh, upfront savings that you've indicated in column C. Okay. I'll say, say that is a bit of a question to council members. Okay. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, I, I do. Just a, a quick one. I'm trying to understand column H. I, I want to understand whether the, 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 the savings that, that's represented there is based on if we were to wait and do this at 11-1-2023 and assuming interest rates did not go up and they were where they are right now. It, that's it, right. You could wait three years. Okay. And that's when the call date on the existing 2013 bonds it, that's when the call date is for the current bonds that you're paying on. So okay. three more years goes by, we assume nothing happens to rates and okay. you could achieve uh, between fiscal years 24 out through 36, you could achieve gross dollars of 1.4 million or, you know, Got close it. to it on a present value basis. Got it. And if, uh, if, if we were to refinance now with the, um, with the taxable bonds, they, this would be locked up. So we couldn't refinance again for 10 years. Is that right? On, on this particular bond offering, correct? Co correct. Well, just 
to be clear, right now we're advance refunding the bonds on a taxable basis ahead of their call date. So we're three years ahead of the call date right now okay. and we're refunding the bonds, right? Got so it. you can have another shot at it. We just don't know what rates are gonna do, either taxable or tax exempt rates. And what this is just trying to demonstrate is what the current market is in which you can achieve versus a what if scenario if we were to wait for three years and be able to do this on a tax exempt basis. Even if rates move halfway against us, it's gonna eat into some of that $1.4 million, right? So right. what we're saying on line seven is just measuring right now compared to current market, the interest rate would have to go up 1.65%. You see that? Uh, I'm sorry, wh where was that again? On line seven, I'm looking at, uh, I think it's on the screen, savings B approach, upfront savings B approach. I think it's page, is it page 10? Yeah, there you go, thank you. Um, so if you're looking at line seven, the green bar that stretches across the page under each scenario. Okay. So let me go back through this because this was, uh, this is an important factor here. Um, let's re let's re talk through this. So right now, column B is if we moved ahead in this fall pool on a taxable advanced refunding basis, we could achieve $635,000 and pull about 500,000 of that up into 2022. Another 93,000 in 21. All right. Now, if we set our parameter in the resolution at 7% present value, that's the next column over. And what we're saying with that 19 basis points is if interest rates increase against us over the next 30 days or 28 days when they price their bonds, it will it will set, it'll achieve 7% PV. It'll, the rate movement up 19, 20 basis points will break even the current market at 7%. Okay. And I think that was the thought last time is that you're, you're comfortable moving forward with the upfront approach at maybe 7%, if that's the right number, but you're, also just as comfortable waiting until next spring or 18 months or three years from now, um, potentially trying to get more savings um, at a future date if you can, but we just don't know. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, th th that's the thing. I mean, we're, 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 we're making a bet that interest rates are going to go up and that's why I felt kind of strongly about raising that that floor to seven percent. I I don't know how the rest of city council feels, but I mean, yeah. So far from the conversations and the uh, lack of pushback, I think everyone's focused in on the seven percent as you are, Dennis. Okay. And a uh, comfort level of that bird in the hand. Um, anticipating we have no control what rates will do in the next 27 days. Uh, but if we do have a, a ideal circumstance and uh, rates bottom out a little bit more and we get closer to 10%, maybe $650,000 in the next two years um, would be wonderful. But again, if we find um, two weeks from now, interest rates move and we're at 6.99, uh, we'll just wait till spring or for the regular refunding in three years. Yeah, and just to clarify on that, I mean, it could bounce up and down between now and pricing. And if it, like you said, bumps down, call it 6%, but then it bumps back up to 7% on October 28th, you might have been below the benchmark for the next couple of weeks, let's say, but then it rates went back in our favor if they can achieve your parameter, it will be executed. Right. If I could first, uh, Dennis, thanks for asking these questions. And, and I mean, I, I think it's been beneficial to me and probably others, your questions. Uh, to RT, I, I assume that you've got other, you know, clients 
uh, that are, you know, looking at the same type of thing? I mean, is, is are we, I mean, are we acting uh, in a similar fashion as other clients it, with a floor, if you will, at the 7% present value savings? Are, are other clients doing a similar type at the 7% or a varying percentage? I'd say yes, and it's it's never one size fits all either. So the dollars y'all might be achieving at 7% present value might be less than somebody looking for 3% PV because that, that gets them a million dollars, let's say. So it, it all varies depending upon the situation. Um, the taxable advance refundings, we've actually done quite a few of these since last year and, and maybe 18 18 plus months out. Um, and it always, it varies from entity to entity. Um, but I would say that 7% is a, is a fair parameter. Um, if, if we can hopefully market, we'll hang in there and we can achieve better than 7%, but at a minimum, that's gonna get you $460,000, $70,000 over the next two fiscal years in budgetary savings. So I think that's sort of the, the upshot here, I think, um, and I'll defer to staff, Jake and Jim might have a little bit more perspective on how those dollars might be helpful. Sir? Well, I think, I think we sorry, discussed this, some of us individually, but also as a group last time is that, you know, this will allow U.S. City Council to invest in things that are important to our community today. Uh, whether they're infrastructure related to VDOT, whether there are other projects in the community. Um, and hopefully over the years, that develops a better return on investment than if we leave these funds in the market and take our chances over two or three years, et cetera, um, especially with the interest rates being as low as they are. If we invest wisely, if council invests wisely, we could uh, enhance the use of those funds today and, and re return greater value to the community. Very good. Any other questions members of council have? Uh, so if I may, it's RT from Davenport. Just one other um, point uh, or two rather. Um, so this evening we're looking for guidance, number one, um, by way of action on the resolution and the desired parameter that we've discussed that net present value savings. But we also would, would like council um, to confirm if that's the case that their preferred savings approach would be the upfront savings B option that we're showing this evening as opposed to the level savings. Just want to make sure um, we're clear in the direction going forward if, if, if council decides um, it's in the best interest to proceed. Uh, my recollection is those are both in, Jake, are those both in the um Resolution. I was trying to find it real quick. Yes, Mr. Mayor, that's correct. So the resolution that you received uh, in your packet prior to uh, identifies just what RT summarized: um, seven percent threshold, or we don't proceed, and uh, prefer the upfront um, savings. Is there any objection to to that? Um, he hearing none, I would ask for your consideration of uh, the resolution. I move to approve the resolution authorizing the advance refunding of the series 2013 VRA bon bonds in the fall 2020 financing pool. Second. Thank you, Leslie, and a second by Michelle. Any further discussion? Uh, hearing none, ask for a roll call vote. Mr. Smith? Aye. Mr. Ayers? Aye. Ms. Strawn? Aye. Mr. Ziegler? Aye. Ms. Hentz? Aye. Ms. Alexander? Okay. Motion carries unanimously. RT, go to market and uh, make us proud and get the numbers uh, to our favor if at all possible. <laughs> we'll, we'll do our best. Thank you. Y'all have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you for uh, uh, sticking in there with us. Absolutely. That's what we're here for. Any other thoughts or concerns or issues to come before council this evening? 
if, if not before we adjourn, um, I just wanted to um, uh, share a circumstance. As you all know, we have incredibly dedicated, hardworking staff um, with the rains, I believe yesterday that, that came so significantly, um, there was some uh, flooding on Lime Kiln Road and some citizens uh, whose homes were getting inundated with the water and um, called Department of Public Works and um, Butch amongst some others. We went out there in the rain and, and helped the uh, uh, um, citizen deal with the water and working on solutions for runoff on that street. But uh, just to, um, I think the, the citizen was very appreciative, certainly, but also very impressed with the, the quick response of our uh, Department of Public Works and uh, working and helping despite the miserable elements of cool temperatures and uh, pouring rain. So kudos and appreciation to our staff. Uh, Jeff Martone and his whole team and all the things that they do to, to make our city um, shine and uh, an even better place to live. Um, with uh, There's nothing else to come uh, before us. Uh, we will stand adjourned. Thank you all very much. Have a great night.